Hello, everybody, and welcome to part two of the presentation. This part's going to be focused on the college search. So if you are watching for the junior presentation, part two, this is the college search process. I will turn off my camera so that way you can see the whole screen and we will move through the presentation. All right. So we are going to focus primarily here on factors the student should consider when choosing a college. So there's about 4,000 universities in colleges in the United States. So how are you gonna ever choose and choose well? That's definitely a question that students think about every single year. And it is definitely a valid way and a valid thought to be having right now. So how about we talk about 10 ways not to be thinking about a college? We're not gonna go through all of these, you know, ways to not be thinking about a college, but let's go over some of the big ones. Don't choose a college because your friends told you about it. Don't choose a college because it's a party school. Don't choose a college because, you know, you saw it on a TV show. And one of the big ones that I want to stress to you is don't choose a college because you got an email or a letter in the mail. If you've never even heard of the college, you never looked at their website, you never applied there, you never... Uh, visited it, you never went to their you visits page like I told you to in the last video, and you got a letter saying that you've been accepted, you just need to go to this link. That is not the college you should be applying to. If it's if it does it doesn't seem real, if it seems too good to be true, it's probably good to too good to be true. That mantra, that's a that's true. Don't don't go to their that's that's not that's le not legit. So if it's school that you like love and they send it to you. If you've been thinking about going to Illinois State since you were in eighth grade and Illinois State sends you a letter because you were on their mailing list, that's awesome. If some random school from the middle of Kentucky sends you a letter in the mail saying that they want you to go there and you've never looked at it, bring that to your counselor. Talk to me about it. That's something that like we can research with you. So that's what we're here for. We're here to help you with that. So again, another reason, just because you saw your favorite celebrity on Instagram say that that's a great school to go to. Not a great reason to go to the school. Let's talk about some reasons that are great reasons to go to the school, though. Some great reasons to go to the school is because of cost or selectivity, location, athletics, campus life, major. These are good reasons to go to a school. It, it like fits inside of your budget. It meets your selectivity. It the locations where you've always thought about. It has the athletics, if that's what that you're looking for. The campus life meets your campus life status, your, the things that you've always thought about, and it has a major. The college search is about the process of finding the right fit. It needs to match all of your criteria. You need to know what your criteria is first. So what's the parent's role? So we're gonna talk a lot about what your criteria is as a student. What, what do your parents have to do? What is your family, your guardians? What do they need to provide in this search? It's important to think about and talk about because their role is important. And so they need to encourage the timeline. That whole video we talked about a lot when it came to the timeline. The encouragement piece, the making sure, the following up, the keeping you encouraged, that's important for your family to, to keep you encouraged, to keep you um, focused on that timeline. Providing transportation, making sure that you feel like you have a way to get where you need to be. That's another great role for the, for the parents and the guardians. Talking about finances, this is a big one. Um, you need to have really honest, upfront conversations about finances now, so that way it's not a shock later. It's hard for students when it comes to like crunch time, when it's you know right before decision day, when we're talking about March and April of your senior year, to figure out where you want to go to school if an honest conversation has never been had with family about what is and isn't realistic to then find out this is just not realistic. Having those conversations now about what is possible is really important. Setting up parameters up front, not just about finances, but all of the parameters that are important. If there's no way that it is going to be okay for a student to go to England or to Alaska, that's something that needs to be set up front. Um, I know your student's gonna be an adult, they're gonna be 18, but every family has its own dynamic and setting up the parameters for your family is something that you need to talk about now. Don't let your students' dreams get too far ahead of themselves if you have really set 
um, standards in mind. So get those parameters set now. Model positive attitudes. This is huge. There are going to be a lot of up moments when it comes to this college search process. There's going to be a lot of down moments and there's going to be a million moments in between. Continuing to, pot, to model positive attitudes throughout for your student is going to be huge. You need to be the one that's there always at like the best for your student. When they're going through all of their low moments, continuing to keep them um, motivated and to be there to support them. Those are huge. Letting them know when things are not going well, when they're feeling stressed or they're feeling overwhelmed or they're feeling down about something. They get a rejection letter in the mail or they're feeling like they can't do one more application. They're feeling like their personal essay isn't the best personal essay. Letting them know you're there for them to support them. If they need to scream and yell, give them the pillow to scream and yell into. If they need to just like vent, you're there to listen to them. Um, be that for them. Model those positive attitudes. Let them know it's just you're, once they get through this, they can get through anything. Like really being a positive role model and being there for them is great. If you've never been to college yourself, being open and honest about that's great too. Letting them know like you're going to be the first generation in this family to get to college. Like that's huge for us. Like we're so proud of you. Like these are huge things. Letting them know that is Really great positive attitude to, to let your child know. Letting the college search and application process be student driven. Remember each student is unique. Feel free to reach out for help with the student. I talked about this in the last video and I just wanna reiterate, I'm happy to spend time and work with parents. I enjoy doing that and I've done that many times before, but this is a student driven process. Your student has to create their, has to fill out their application, has to write their student essays, has to do their scholarships. Um, this has to be a student driven process. So please, if, if there are questions, if you want to have appointments, please make sure the student is participating with you because this has to be about them. They're the ones that's going to be going off to college at a certain point. This is a self-advocating uh, journey that they are going to be doing themselves. So this needs to be student driven. Now let's talk about you students and let's talk about the college search because this is how we, we're going to figure out where you're going next. So there's no, we, we as college career counselors talk about the five P's of college search planning. It just makes it easier. It's a fun mnemonic. It's a fun device. Person, people, place, program, price. We'll start with the person. The person is you. This is you, the student. So you have to self-assess and identify the things that you um, care about and that you want in your college. So think about why are you going to college? What are your goals? What are your talents? What are your needs? What are the things that like you want in your school? What kind of student are you? What's the kind of rigor of courses? What kind of grades? What is your SAT? Like, what have you done now? Are you in all AP classes? Are you in honors classes? Uh, what are your grades? Are you a student that had a 1500 on the SAT? Did you have an 800 on the SAT? Were you somewhere in the middle? This is important when you're looking at the type of school you're going to apply to. If you had a 1000 on the SAT and you had a 2.75 GPA, there are a lot of schools you can get into. It's not going to be the University of Chicago. It's just not. There, there is the perfect school for you, the University of Chicago, where you need to have a 1580 on your SAT and a 4.5 GPA. That's not going to be the right fit for you. But you have to figure out where the right fit is. And so figuring that out now is a really important time to do that. Um, think about your extracurricular activities. Do you want those extracurricular activities to be something you do in college? If you loved being in band here, do you want there to be opportunities for you to be in the band in college? Do you want, um, or do you not want that? So, but if you do, you want to make sure that there's some kind of club or activity, or do you want to be in the marching band, like on their actual marching band at school? These are things you need to think about. What's the learning style? your academic environment, your personality, et cetera. I went to the University of Iowa my freshman year. I went to school. Um, I went to a class that was uh, intro to psychology. There were hundreds of people there. It was in a giant auditorium. It was two levels. I was, uh, I felt like a very small person in a very, very large sea of people. It did not work for me. It took me, um, 
not very long at all to realize it was not the right place. I also realized being in Iowa wasn't the right place for me. So, but it's because I didn't think about these things ahead of time. I wish I would have had a college and career counselor that had a serious conversation about like, what does the college search process look like? What does self-assessment look like? Um, it does take introspection and it does take time to think about like, who am I and what does this look like? But if you can do that now, if you can really think about like, what do I care about? And what do I need um, as a student? It will help you so much in the future because it'll get you to the right place. If you're the kind of student that like needs to be in a big city, then being in a small town isn't going to work for you. Then we want to make sure you're applying to a mixture of schools, but you want to make sure you have some city schools in that mix. You don't want to not apply to a big city school if that's what that's what preferred. If you know that um, being in small classes are important to you, then you don't want to apply to a school where all of your classes are going to be with 300 students in it. That's not going to work. People, what kind of school are you going to be going to? Do you want diversity for the school? Do you want it to be a, a politically active school? There's going to be schools like UC Berkeley that are extremely politically active. I mean, that's just what they're known for. You can go to New York and it's going to be super, super. I mean, it's New York City. It's crazy and fun. And it's going to be just a whole different experience. Um, religious affiliation. There are schools that are based and steeped in a religious affiliation, which requires you to take religious courses, even if you are not practicing that religious faith. Uh, and so you have to take those courses. It's a requirement for the school. If you are, again, not a practicing member of that religion, you still need to take courses in that religion in order to move forward. If that doesn't interest you, then applying to those schools may not be the best option for you. If you think to yourself, that actually is really interesting. I can learn a lot. I can learn about different cultures and different religions. And that's something that you should do. Think about the regional culture. We're from the Midwest. It's a lot different than the Southwest. It's a lot different than the East Coast and the West Coast. D does that interest you? Does that disinterest you? Think about athletics, fraternities, sororities. Big 10 schools have giant sports, have really steeped in fraternities and sororities. If you love that, that's something that you should definitely think about applying to. If that's something that you're like, nope, definitely not, not my thing, then you should not apply there. Student faculty rapport. In my story about Iowa, for me, I was being taught by TA, so teacher's assistants in my freshman courses. There was a professor, he taught the class, but anytime I had, I, I needed help or support and I needed to reach out, it was a teacher's assistant. They were senior level, junior level college kids. Sometimes they were grad school students at Iowa, but I very rarely have ever spoke to the professor. The professor had a whole crew of students that were also helping. Sometimes classes were like literally taught by teacher assistants and not a professor. If you want to be taught by directly by professor professors and have access to them, smaller schools with smaller classrooms are the way to go. And then think about connections and networking opportunities. If you want to go to a school that um, is like a great business school and has really great opportunities, then think about schools that are known for being great um, net business schools. That's where you're going to get networking opportunities. The place. Think about the size of the school. Think about the distance from home. Think about the average class size, the area, the climate, the type of school. Is it a public school versus a private school? Is it a liberal arts school versus a vocational school? Um, think about the location of the school. Is it urban, suburban, rural? We'll get into what that means in a second. And then think about reputation. If you think you want to be a marine biology major, don't go to a landlocked state. You're going to need to go to a state that's by the ocean. You cannot study marine biology from the middle of the United States. You have to go by the water in order to study marine biology. There needs to be water somewhere. Um, it's just something to think about. Um, also think about like if you're a homebody, if you love being close to home and you don't wanna have to take a plane, a train, an automobile to get there, don't live really, really, really far away. Otherwise it's gonna be hard to get home. It's also expensive to get home if you need to do that. If you live a few hours away, you can get home anytime you want. And on the opposite side, if you're the kind of person that wants to be six or eight hours away, then think about that when choosing that. So urban, suburban, rural, what does that mean? 
urban is going to be in a major city. UIC is going to be in a major city. It is a major city. It's, well, Chicago is a major city. University of Illinois, Chicago. That's where I ended up at. So after I left Iowa, I decided I needed a complete change. So I went to a different public school, but in Illinois, which was much cheaper because it was an Illinois public school and not Iowa, which was out of state. So now I was in state in Illinois because I grew up in Illinois. And I went to a big city instead of a cornfield. And it was so much better. The classes were smaller. Uh, they were still big classes, but much smaller. And it was in a city and it was it was exactly where I needed to be for who I am. And I loved it. You could see Sears Tower, now Willis Tower in the background from my dorm room. It was awesome. Dominican is in a suburb, which is what Round Lake is. So it was surrounded by trees. There were restaurants everywhere. It was very much like in the, like even Lake Forest. Lake Forest is a, like Lake Forest College is a suburb uh, school. And then there's Western. Western is a lot like University of Iowa. It is going to be that rural feel. It is a major college campus. The whole town is created because of the college, the university, and then everything around it is going to be um, fields. And so it's really, really fun on campus. It's a great experience, but that is what keeps the whole town going is that college experience. So that's what you have to think about. Like, do you love that? If you're looking for sports and you're looking for like a really strong community of college, like life, that's a really great place to go. So here's a yes or no question for you. Is it closer to attend an in-state school than it is to go to an out-of-state school from Round Lake High School? Well, sometimes it is, sometimes it isn't. That doesn't make any sense. Is that what you're thinking? It's okay. What I'm trying to say is there's 49 colleges and universities within an hour from Round Lake. Um, and some of them are right over the border. So I want everybody to think to themselves, like just because it's in-state, which does give you in-state tuition, doesn't mean it's necessarily closer. We are in the very, very upper part of Illinois, which sometimes means that schools are much closer to us right at the border of Illinois. Even University of Madison, as we'll talk about in a second, uh, University of Wisconsin-Madison is closer to us than Southern. So CLC is only about five or 10 minutes away. That is our close community college just right nearby. University of Wisconsin Parkside is only 40 minutes away, still super close. That's drivable. University of Illinois Chicago is only an hour, an hour and a half if you get stuck in traffic. University of Wisconsin-Madison, huge school, comparable to University of Illinois Champaign-Urbana, wonderful school, hard school to get into, two and a half hours away. You're not going to drive that. But if you go to campus there, you could always come home on a weekend, see your family, get back. And then Southern Illinois, um, Carbondale is about six hours away. So that's a long drive. That's not a quick uh, weekend drive. That's something you got to plan for. But you could always be home for the holidays, which is nice. The next P is program. So you have to think about academic majors. Is your major offered? Is it a direct admit major? How hard is it to change your major? What's the strength of the major? So first up, is your major offered? Don't go to a school if your major is not offered there. If you want to be a psychology major and the school doesn't have psychology, going to that school is um, pointless. I, bluntly, it is pointless. You don't want to go to a school that doesn't have your major. That means you're not going to be able to graduate with that. You have to choose a different major. They cannot provide you any of the courses that you need to get your major. You could do undergraduate credits. You could take your core classes at that school and then transfer. But if you're going to a two-year or a four-year college and paying $20,000 a year for courses to not get your full degree because they don't have your major, that's a lot of money to get your core classes out of the way. Is it a direct admit major? So some schools have direct admit to law programs or nursing programs. That is huge if you are trying to get into a nursing or a medical or a law degree program because it means that you have been admitted into their program with a lot of terms and conditions. You have to keep your grades up. You need to make sure you're taking the right courses. They're going to really keep an eye on you. Um, but you know that once you complete um, X, Y, and Z, the stipulations involved in the direct admit program, every school is different, that you will be accepted into their nursing program after your undergrad. That's huge. You don't have to worry about like, am I going to get into nursing school? Will I get into law school? Will I get into my med program after? 
how hard is it to change your major? Students change majors. It, it, it happens. After two years of being in college, you may change your mind. You may have thought you loved psychology, but really what you love is biology. That's okay. It happens. It happens often. It, it, if it does happen to you, don't be nervous. It, it's easier for you to change your mind after the first year or the second year because you're taking core classes those years um, than it is to change your third year. Uh, but it's still possible because you could take those credits and make them into a minor. But some schools, it's really hard to change your major. So these are questions you should ask during your rep visits. Like, what's it like if I want to change my major at your school? Do you have options? What does it look like? And then the strength of the major of the program. You want to know how your major looks at that school. If you go to University of Illinois Champaign for an engineering program, that's, that's, they, that's known for it. That's a great school. Um, Indiana is known for their business program. University of Illinois is known for their nursing program. Like there are schools that are known for their majors at their school. Is the school you're applying to known for their major? Keep that in mind. Then think about double majors or minors. Are they, do they have them at the school? Does your school have internships? A lot of schools these days are requiring you to have internships to graduate. Um, private schools, that's something you're gonna see more and more at private schools. Less at public schools requiring internships, more at private schools. Do they have the study abroad option? If you're planning on wanting to do study abroad and they don't have study abroad at your school, do you want to apply there? If you've always dreamed about studying in Italy for a semester, but there's no study abroad office, that's going to be difficult. You want to be at a school that has study abroad if that's what you've always thought about. And then what does it mean if you don't know what major you want to be in? Do they have an undecided or undeclared major? Think about that too. So let's talk about price. That's going to be um, important. So don't roll out of school initially because of price. So just because a school has a high sticker price doesn't mean that is exactly what the price is going to be. And that works two ways. We'll talk about that when we get to sticker price first and that's cost. Don't always assume CLC is always cheaper. There are um, ways that CLC isn't always the cheapest option. CLC is typically going to be the cheaper option, but there are ways that that is not true. Um, that is going to be when we talk about like scholarships and financial aid. So let's put a, a pin in that. Uh, sticker price first net cost. What does that mean? So sticker price is that price that it says on the website. So when you see, you know, when you think about like tuition, if a school says it's going to be $12,000 for the tuition, that's, that's the sticker price. Think about net cost though. Think about everything that's included in that. Think about the total cost of attendance. Think about all the things that are included that are included besides that to get to that total net cost. So it's not just the $12,000 for tuition you have to think about when you're thinking about the total to go to school. Um, if you're going away to campus, so let's use University of Iowa as an example again. So to go to University of Iowa, it's gonna cost much more than $12,000, but let's use $12,000 as a baseline. So tuition, 12,000, plus now you have to stay on campus. So room and board is gonna cost you money. Books, you're going to have to pay for books. And then there's fees. If you're taking lab science courses, that's going to cost you fees. There'll be technology fees. There'll be printing fees, et cetera. Transportation, you're going to have to get to school. It may be easy to get to Iowa. It may be a bus ride. It may be a car ride. You may have parking passes. Go even further out. Say you decide you want to go to school in uh, Washington, in the state of Washington. You're going to have to take a plane ride. You're going to have to get your items there. That's going to cost you money. There's even the, the little things about how are you going to get bedding? How are you going to get all these items? Sure, you could just get Amazon and ship your things there for free with Amazon Prime, but that costs money. So little things like that. And then there's all those additional fees. Room and board. Board is the food package when you do room and board. So you'll get a meal plan, but there's little things you want to do. You're going to want to get a pizza on a Friday night and go see a movie when everything opens up. All those things cost money. So you have to think about that when it comes to net cost. And then there's financial aid and scholarships. So what's your eligibility? If you're a non-US citizen, if you're a DACA student, you're not eligible for um, the federal um, package. You are eligible for state money in this state, but you're not eligible for state money in other states. Um, you can still get institutional private grants and scholarships. So you're again, you are eligible for state money in Illinois, but you won't be in other states. Um, there may be deals in your school, again, that will be able to get you the grant and scholarship money. 
In Illinois, you can apply for the RISE application. So that's the RISE alternative application if you're undocumented, if you're a non-US citizen, if you're a DACA student. Uh, if you can complete the FAFSA, you would be eligible, eligible for the MAP and the Pell Grant. If you're eligible for both of those, if you have a expected family contribution that is a zero or on the lower end of the expected family contribution, you may be eligible for uh, upwards to $11,000 in Pell money and MAP money together. So that means that you would get grant money. Grant money is free money. Scholarship money is free money. That's money you're not paying back to schools. So those are some money um, options that would go to the school that would help it bring that price down. There's also, like I said, scholarship money. And that scholarship money could mean either um, there's presidential scholarships, there's uh, chancellor scholarships, there's really great scholarships at school, school specific scholarships that will help you get the prices of school down significantly all the way down to a full ride. Those scholarships are huge. I mean, could you imagine a full ride scholarship? Like there are students that do it every single year. There's multiple students in the senior class of 2021 that are on full ride scholarships or they're on full tuition scholarships that have received it this year. So it is possible. The best way to get those types of scholarships is being accepted to a school and applying to those school specific scholarships. How do we pay for the rest of it? So say you get a, um, Say you go to a school and the school is $20,000. You get $15,000 in scholarship and grant money. Well, there's $5,000 left over that needs to be paid for. You have to pay that $5,000 in two segments. You owe the money in fall when you start, and then you owe the second half of that money in the spring for second semester. So you would owe $2,500 in fall, and then you would owe that second $2,500 in spring. So how are you gonna pay for it? Well, you have to think about that. So is it gonna be owed? Are you gonna pay for it with savings? Does the student have savings? Family, do you have savings? Is there an expectation? Have you said to the student that you're gonna pay for it? Um, again, that's why you have to have that conversation now about what's this gonna look like? Uh, are you gonna work? Students, there's work study program where you can work through the school. You have to say that when you're completing your FAFSA, you're eligible and you're interested in completing the work study program. Um, if you say that you're not interested in work study program, then they won't offer that to you. The work study program is gonna allow you to work on campus. They're normally pretty easy jobs. I mean, you would be doing pretty like front desk work or doing mailbox slot, like mail slot work where you put mail in like the dorm room mailboxes, really easy jobs that work around your schedule, maybe working at the library or the bookstore, or scanning cards at the cafeteria. So easier jobs that work around your college schedule, it will never interfere with classes. So that's what they're no, they know that they're not allowed to schedule you during your classes. It may mean that you don't have as much study time because they can't work around that, but they will not work, they will work around your school schedule. Um, you could also take out loans. There's the uh, loans that are gonna be federally subsidized and unsubsidized, but they're actually through the US government. Those loans will not have to be paid back until after you graduate. So students, you will have your uh, two years if you're doing an associate's degree or your four years if you're doing your bachelor's degree before you have to pay those back. Uh, those are traditionally at the lower end of the interest rates. And then there's also additional scholarships. Like I said, there's those nationwide scholarships that you can apply for in Fast Web or Going Mary. And then we do uh, local scholarships that you'll see on the website, on our college website, on our counseling website, the college links. There's also a scholarship board outside of my office. I send emails to every single senior whenever there is a local scholarship that comes up that talks about what the scholarships are that are local scholarships. Local scholarships are incredible. You are applying for scholarships against students either just in the Round Lake area, the Lake County area, or specifically Round Lake High School only. So you are applying against a very small batch of students, 15, 20, 25, 30 students applying for sometimes one, two, three, four scholarships, um, $1,500, $2,000 scholarships. So again, if you're talking about this example of $5,000, if you win one or two scholarships at $1,000, that covers 2,000 of that 5,000. That's a big chunk. 
Now you get a work study program and that work study program is 3000. You've covered that whole 5,000. And then also it's a joke, generous relatives. I mean, it's a lot to expect somebody to pay for your college, but you could have people that have been saving for years. I know that um, people put bonds that they do for events. So if you have any money saved from family members, now is the time to uh, dip into that, that fund if anybody's been saving for you for many, many years. Make sure to think about long-term costs, not just about your freshman year. You are going to school for either two or four years, sometimes longer if you're getting a master's or a doctoral degree. So you have to think about the entire time. In my example of the $5,000 a year student, you need that $5,000 from the $20,000 offset. That's only one year. That student's going to a four-year college. That would end up being $20,000. It's a lot more when you think about it. Now, switch the example. Say the student only had $5,000 in grant and scholarship money. So they had to come up with $15,000 a year to offset. That would be $15,000 a year times four. Now you're talking about how the student has to come up with $60,000 a year in money. It's a really big chunk. Um, so if a student goes to College of Lake County, that's about $4,000 a year to go to College of Lake County for the full year for just the tuition piece. So it is a significant savings to go to CLC when it comes to just the tuition piece. What are some other things to consider? So those are the P's. Now let's talk about the O, which is not part of the five. The five P's, these are just things to think about. Um, if you have a 504 or an IEP and you wanna know about what options are available for you, there is a learning, um, there's an options fair. It is to be determined the date and the time. They do one every year with the pandemic. They had to do it virtual last year and I am anticipating they will do another one this year. It's called Options Fair. This year will be called the Options Fair 2021. You can Google it and just keep an eye out for when it will be available. Uh, it will probably be another uh, virtual event. I think the best way to get information about this though is to go again directly through your college admission representative. If you're thinking you wanna to go to a school, I would just reach out during those college rep visits. You don't need to do it in front of um, other students. You don't need to do it in front of other people at all in general. Get the representative's email address or phone number during the college rep visits, and then just send them an email afterwards and ask, hey, I have a 504 plan, I have an IEP plan, I get a little bit of extra time when I take tests at, in high school, and I'm trying to figure out what that's gonna look like if I come to, uh, your school. I'm thinking about coming to Eastern Illinois University. What does it look like? I'm thinking about coming to University of Illinois Springfield. Can you walk me through that? What does the Augustana um, options look like for students that have, uh, that need a little bit of extra time when it comes to writing? They'll be able to help you. They're really, 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 really knowledgeable, these college representatives. So ask them, they will be able to help you. What about if you're a college uh, bound athlete, what if you're thinking you're going to play D1 or D2, or if you're thinking you're going to be at a D3 school or an NAIA school, what do you do? What should you be doing? Well, if you believe you're going to be in a D1 or D2 sport, then you should be in the NCAA clearinghouse. Uh, you need to be in the NCAA clearinghouse. We need to get you through that. Uh, there is traditionally a fee to get into the NCAA clearinghouse. There is a fee waiver for that. So please do not pay to be in the NCAA clearinghouse if you are a Round Lake High School student. You are eligible for a fee waiver for being an NCAA clearinghouse member. So Round Lake High School students do not pay to be in the NCAA clearinghouse. Partner with me, Mr. Bruno. If you believe you will be playing NCAA D1 or D2 sports and you will be getting a scholarship, partner with your coach with the athletic director or myself, and we will get you processed through this. Um, and you should be doing that now. This is important that you get this done during your junior year. If you think you're gonna be playing at an NAIA school, you can do that at the end of your junior year. There's about um, 351 D1 schools, 308 D2 schools, um, and there's about 180,000 D1 athletes, 122 D2 athletes. So. It does, that may seem like a lot, but that's a, that's a very, very small amount of athletes compared to the amount of students out there. That's a small fraction of students that actually end up playing D1, D2 sports. So it is very hard to get an athletic scholarship in a D1 or D2 school. It is the top of the top students that get those scholarships for D1 or D2 sports. Um, but it happens. We have had students in the past that have gone 
um, into D1 or D2 sports. So we need to make sure you're in the clearinghouse because if you do get that scholarship and you're not registered in the clearinghouse, you won't be able to move forward. So um, I also have a really great outline and packet and timeline for college bound athletes that I have sent out to students. And I will send out again, if you need to, um, if you would like that, just reach out to me. What are you thinking about uh, the military service? So you should be thinking at this point, do you wanna be a part of the military service before college? Do you wanna do it while you're in college? Do you wanna juggle military and college or do you wanna do the military service afterwards? Military service is great if you wanna be part of the GI Bill, if you want them to help you offset college. I mean, they will pay for the whole shebang or they'll pay for the majority of it. It's a really good way to get college paid for and it's an outlet that a lot of people use to pay for college. So if that's something you're thinking about, if that's the right way for you to go, then that is um, something you need to be thinking about how you wanna do that. Uh, we do not have military recruiters in the building right now since we are going virtual slash hybrid, um, but all of the information for our recruiters are on our website. Just go to that college, uh, go to the counselor tab, and on the left, you'll see recruiters. So go ahead and click that. If you wanna reach out to any of the branches, our local recruiter information is right on the website. You will need to take the ASVAB if you are interested in becoming a member of one of the branches of the military. The ASVAB is their version of the testing to see where you uh, rank and where you could be placed. So if you're interested in taking the ASVAB, you will take that with your local recruiter. They will get that set up with you. So please make sure if you're interested in that, you reach out to a recruiter. And then if you're thinking you wanna get into an honors program in college, just make sure you're keeping an eye out for the deadlines because honors program deadlines are not always exactly lined up with the program deadlines for application. So that early action deadline of November 1st, or December 1st or November 15th is not always the exact same deadline for honors programs. Sometimes it fluctuates since it's a little bit different of a program. So, and the requirements and the things they need, applications, teacher recommendations, et cetera, may be a little bit different. If you're thinking about getting into an honors program, you really wanna make sure you have all your ducks in a row. So what does your college search look like? How many schools should you have? What should What's a safety school, what's a match school, what's a reach school? Um, all really good questions. So students should have about five to eight schools on their college search. It can, it can fluctuate. You can go 10 schools, you can go four schools. It can, it can vary. And if you're getting into you know, the 15, 20 schools on your list, that, that's probably reaching a bit far. It, again, it varies for every student, but you wanna narrow your list. Once you've applied to those five to eight schools, if you wanna to apply to more schools, um, if you have the time, then that's a, that's a good conversation for you and your counselor or for meeting you to have. But really focusing on a, a narrowing it down to five to eight schools will let you do your absolute best to give your all to applying to these schools. You should have one to two safety schools. Safety schools are schools you know you're gonna get into. It's safe, you're gonna get in, you have, the chances are very high. We're talking 80 to 100% chance of getting into it. One of them should be CLC. CLC should be your safety school. And then there can be one more safety school if you'd like. Two to four schools should be your match school. So for this student example that I have to the right, and this is actually what it can look like on score. So if you look to the right with the photo, that is what you can make your uh, student college search look like on score. So for this student, um, their safety school is College of Lake County, their match school for the student. The student's GPA is a 3.0. So their match is Northeastern, Northern, Southern Illinois, Carbondale, and Western Illinois. Those are all great schools. Northern, Northeastern, Southern, University of Illinois, Springfield also, and Western. So they actually have five match schools. So Perfect, really, really good schools. Um, instead of doing two safety schools, they decided to just fluctuate a little bit. They did five match schools. I'm okay with that. Like I said, it varies. So they're still on the eight list. And then two reach schools. So these are the schools that um, are gonna be a little bit difficult for you to get into. They don't match exactly your GPA. They don't match exactly your SAT, but they're schools you're excited about and they're schools you still wanna work to get into. 
You're going to work hard on your college essay. You're going to let them know about all of the clubs and activities. You're going to let them know about all of the things you've done in your community. You're going to let them know why you would be an asset to their, to their campus, why they need you to be at their school, how you're going to make them better. Those are your REACH schools. If you're a 3.0 student, University of Illinois Chicago is going to be a REACH school. University of Illinois Urbana is going to be very much a REACH school. University of Illinois Urbana Champaign is taking 3.75, 3.8 and above students at this point. Um, University of Illinois is going to be a pretty far reach for that student, but that's a school they want to apply to. We're going to we're going to help them get to that. We're going to help them apply for that school. We're going to help you get your your ducks in a row again, and we're going to get you through that application. The student must be happy with all the options. This list has to be student approved. You're the one doing all the work, student. You need to make sure that like all the schools on your list you love, you want to go to, or at least you're excited about. If there's schools on that list that you don't see yourself at, then you really need to figure out, like, why am I spending my time applying to these eight schools? Um, is there a better school I could be applying to? This eight list, this list of eight, need to be like the ones you're working really hard to get into. Uh, this is your like, these are, this is the targeted list. And then once you've worked on this list, we can start digging into like scholarships and you can start working on school specific scholarships once you've been accepted. This is why this college search list is huge. And that's why it's starting now to narrow down and to self assess is important. So we get tons of questions about CLC and why CLC and is CLC a good option. Students want to know like, should I do two years at CLC and then transfer? Is CLC the right school for me? People sometimes ask like, is CLC, as, is it good? Is it not good? There's a lot of like questions and sometimes it's confusing for students. And so I wanna give some clarity around CLC as a whole. So let me talk to you about the benefits of CLC and why CLC is a good option. So tuition is very, very reasonable. It is right around the $4,000 mark. It's a little less than $4,000 and that's for the full year for a full-time student. That is going to be the lowest without any scholarship or grant money tuition you're going to find around. It's for it's community college. Our taxes, your taxes, everybody's taxes in the Lake County area help to keep that price low. Schedule is flexible. It is um, nearby. Classes are small. So if you need to have a job, if you want to work, you can keep those the schedule the way you want and still have the opportunity to have a job. There's a lot of chances to explore different classes because it's community college. And so they have a ton of classes because it's a bigger campus and a lot of students go there. So it allows for a lot of opportunities to try a lot of different classes out. They have partnerships and tr guaranteed transfer agreements with other four-year schools. So CLC has all of these transfer agreements with four-year schools, not just in Illinois, but around the country. Um, where if you take your core classes at CLC, so year one and two, you're going to take core classes, your math, your English, your sciences, that they will transfer directly to those schools and you will get credit for credit, course for course credit for those classes. So you're not just taking classes to take classes. They actually will count at the college you go to for your four-year degree. So you could take two years of classes at the College of Lake County and transfer those credits to Illinois State University to complete your teaching degree. And those classes would count just the same if you took the classes at Illinois State. Um, you just need to make sure you are talking to your counselor at College of Lake County every single step of the way. The most important thing that, if, that you can get from this whole presentation is being a self-advocate for this. The student needs to be a self-advocate for themselves. All the, from the first presentation about checking the email, it's self-advocacy, making sure you're staying on top of it, checking your emails. This presentation, completing your FAFSA, making sure you're getting through it, and then staying a self-advocate for the College of Lake County. You need to make sure your counselor at College of Lake County knows that you wanted to transfer, that you're thinking about transferring. So that way they're making sure that they're getting you in the classes that will transfer. If they do not know you're thinking about transferring or if they do not know that you have colleges in mind, they're not gonna know to put you in those classes. So 
Let them know from the very beginning you're thinking about transferring. If you have an idea of the colleges, that will do you even better to give them those classes and those schools you're thinking about transferring to. You can get those core classes completed. You can have completed cheaper. It may cost six, seven, eight hundred dollars a credit hour at a different college or university where you can get it completed for cheaper here and you're close to home. Uh, you also get a clean slate for your GPA. Um, if you were a student that had a 2.0 GPA in high school and you wanted to go to a school where you needed to have a 3.5 to get into it for a college, they do not, they won't look at your high school GPA once you've had one or two years in college. They're gonna look at your college GPA. Your slate starts fresh. You're gonna be applying to schools as a transfer student once you have a college GPA. So you get to start all over again with your GPA and show them what you, um, what you could be, who you are as a student, as a college student. Uh, CLC is transitional. The whole point of CLC is to get you your associate's degree, to get you your certification degree, um, or to get you to transition into either that next step of life as a professional or that next step of life as to your bachelor's degree. The types of degrees specifically at CLC and where you can get more information of them about them are they have a certificate program, which is just the one year program designed to prepare you for immediate entry into a specific job. So those are jobs um, like the license, they're like licensure program jobs. If you're thinking you wanted to do, um, there's really short term programs. If you wanted to be a realtor, you can do that in less than a year. If you wanted to get into HVAC programs, that might take uh, a year or two years. You can find all of the programs if you want to get into uh, foods, if you want to be a chef, there's tons of programs at CLC. There's tons and tons of them. You can go directly to the website, um, clc.edu programs and classes backslash degrees and certificates. It's right on the screen in front of you. Associates of Arts and Associates in Sciences. Those are two-year degrees designed for students who will transfer to a four-year college and university to, can, to complete a bachelor's degree. You could transfer after one year to a, two, to, to a four-year college, or you could get your associate's degree and transfer after two years to a four-year college. That's up to you. Again, you can look at that website or an Associates of Applied Science. So that's awarded upon completion of a two-year certificate program. That's designed to prepare the student for immediate entry into a specific career. So the Associates of Arts and, of Arts and the Associates of Science, that gets you your associate's degree to go to college the Associates of Applied Science is just that two-year degree that you get and you go right into the workforce. So there's three different kinds of degrees at CLC. One of them will suit you, either the one that will get you into your professional career right away or the one that will get you off into your next step at your next college or university of choice. Again, if the plan is to attend CLC for two years, then transfer to a four-year school. It's extremely important to work with an advisor to make sure all your classes taken will transfer. Familiarize yourself with your potential future college or university transfer requirements, GPA, credit limits, eligible term, et cetera. It's suggested to still apply to four-year schools in the fall to be able to compare options directly. Like I said, it doesn't hurt to continue to apply to schools and use CLC as your safety school. That's why I said a few slides back, use CLC as your safety school, apply to your five to eight schools on your college search list. I just wanna go over the parents role one more time because I think it's really, really important. Encourage that timeline, provide transportation, talk openly and honestly about finances, set up parameters up front, model positive attitude, that's really important. Let the college search application process be student driven. Remember, your student's unique, every student's different. You know your student better than anybody else will, just be there for them. Um, there's going to be a senior parent night information event in August. It should be tentatively August 30th. You'll know more about what that's going to look like once we get closer to the date, if we'll be able to do that in person or if it will be another virtual event. Some more reasons why you would meet with me, like we talked about on my last slide for the Calendly. If you need to register students, this is why you can meet with me. If you need to register for the SAT, um, again, it's test optional. It probably will be test optional for your class too. You'll know a lot more about that come senior week next year. Will there be a lot more data about it? If it is test optional, um, it will truly mean test optional. So you can decide how you wanna do it. 
Uh, you will be taking the test in April. So if you register for the SAT, it would be to do a retake. Um, but if you would like to do that, you can register to take the SAT with me. I can always help you with a college search. It makes me very, very happy to do that. I love working with students to do the college search. I can help you complete applications. I can help you with fee waivers. You almost should never have to pay to apply to colleges. I will talk to you a ton about that during your senior week, but let me, let me give you a spoiler alert. We as a Title I school get fee waivers. I will help you complete the fee waivers. You need me to um, send those in for you. 95% of schools have fee waivers. Don't pay to apply to college. Let me help you get those. So don't pay for college. Don't pay to apply for colleges. Please, look, you're gonna pay plenty of money to colleges in your lifetime. Even if it's just for like pizza at college campus, you're gonna pay a lot of money to college. So don't pay for applications unless you absolutely have to. I can also help you with writing a personal statement or essay. I can help you like with the editing process. I will not write your essay for you. I, that is that is a very personal process, but I can help you with the editing and reading it over and giving you um, some opinions and some help on that. I can help you with what the process looks like for letters of recommendation. I can help you with accessing your transcripts and how to send those out. And I can also help you, like I said, with scholarships. I will be sending you scholarships in your email and I will be giving you um, the links to get to Going Mary, which was on this presentation. Yes, and again, that is me with Britney Spears in a very terrible cat shirt. I wore it on purpose to see if she would realize what it was and she did, she thought it was hilarious. She was a lot nicer than you would have admit. She was so nice. Watch that Britney Spears documentary if you haven't. That was on TV not long ago. Again, there is a question and answer session that will be coming up. Uh, that is Monday, March 29th from 12 to 12.50. Uh, and then another one that's going to be happening in the evening on March 29th from 5 p.m. to 6 p.m. The Zoom links will be sent out to students and families via email. Sessions will be in English and in Spanish. We'll have a breakout room, so everyone is welcome to come. Um, Thank you so much for watching both of these or watching either one of these. We appreciate it. I know this is a super important time and there's a lot of questions and it feels like there's tons of information in both of these and there is, but there's a lot of support. There's so many people in this building and so many people around you that want to support you. Again, just ask for help. We are here to help you. You just gotta let us know if you need it. So thank you so much. And if you need anything, attend this. If you have any questions and your counselors are here, check your email. Like I said, check your email, self-advocate, ask for help. We got your back. 